Welcome to this episode of Your Wellness MD Podcast. Family physician and wellness expert, Dr. Daniela Stein, has meaningful conversations that will take your health to the next level. She explores the connection between a healthy body, mind, and soul, and shares tips that will enable you to thrive. Dr. Stein has helped thousands of people have a better quality of life by improving their health with science-based knowledge, education, better nutrition, mindfulness, and lifestyle choices. Join us today, empowering you to live your best life with optimal health. Hi, and welcome. Today, I have Bonnie with me. Bonnie is going to talk to you about everything you need to know on nutrition and menopause. Things that you can do, foods that you can eat and foods you should avoid, things you can do to take your health to the next level, to thrive through menopause, to be stronger, to be healthier, to be even leaner and more toned than you've been before menopause. It's possible and it's possible through what you eat. I'm Dr. Daniela Stein. I'm a medical doctor and a wellness expert. Bonnie, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Daniela, for having me here. So Bonnie is a nutritionist. Bonnie, tell me a bit about yourself. What, what is a nutritionist? Well, uh, I'm a certified nutritionist, so I work with individuals, I work with uh, groups, I have an online group program, so I work both in person and online. I do meal planning, but I also really dive into the symptoms my clients have, and we really navigate that and get to what's really at the root of that and get personalized in terms of providing um, guidance on reducing inflammation, addressing gut health, weight management, as well as hormone balance. And all of these things are so big and so critical during menopause. So, okay. so many of my listeners have been asking these questions and that's why I have Bonnie here. Bonnie is really a well-known expert in our community. She's a very well-respected nutritionist. So, but Bonnie has all the answers. So yeah. I, want, <laughs> I want Bonnie to share the answers with you today. So first we're gonna talk about Menopause, do we have to eat differently during menopause? Do we have to eat different than we've eaten before menopause? That's, it's interesting because that is one of the questions I get uh, or the comments I get from clients is, well, I haven't changed anything and yet my body is changing. So we really do need to change along with our changing needs. Our bodies become more insulin resistant and uh, so we, we can't uh, get away with the sugars and refined flours the amount of alcohol that we used to consume. That's alcohol is a big one mm -hmm. that I feel people are quite surprised about and not just for weight gain, but also for inflammation. Absolutely, yes. And, and alcohol just triggers blood sugar imbalances, which can then lead to that spike and crash in energy, fatigue, it messes with our sleep. We're already having trouble sleeping at this time in our lives, so um, the alcohol is definitely exacerbating that. Which, which is interesting, a lot of my patients often don't realize that they tell me they need a couple of glasses of wine okay. to wind down at night. Mm -hmm. But the science shows us that even though that wine might make you feel that you wind down easier, you fall asleep easier, you don't go into those deep cycles of sleep. So you don't get that restorative sleep. If we don't get restorative sleep, that is where everything else happens. Then things start to spiral downwards, you start gaining weight mm -hmm. because of that cortisol response in your body when you're not properly rested, you have brain fog the next day, you will be irritable if you didn't sleep well mm -hmm. the night before. So even if it's for not anything else, even if it's just to improve your sleep quality, to really cut back on your alcohol during menopause. Oh, for sure. It also, it's, it stimulates appetite, so you tend to snack more. And then um, because you're not sleeping well, now your appetite regulating hormones are, um, they're not optimal and you're more likely to snack even the next day. Yes, the day, the mm -hmm. day after and, mm -hmm. and snack unhealthy things. Usually after a couple yeah. of glasses of wine, you don't <laughs> feel like making a salad, right? right. <laughs> you feel like chips or something. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, so that's a big thing. So, so nutrition is a big thing. Your body changing is a big thing. Talk a bit about that, how your body changes after menopause. You know, even when people say they've always been eating the same, they have the same amount of movement, now suddenly they'll notice fat around the abdomen, which mm -hmm. they didn't have. I have patients emailing me, they started a bit of, they call it a fat pack on the back. Mm -hmm. Whereas the same weight that you have around your abdomen now kind of goes all, the, all around into love mm -hmm. handles, into the back, which is new for a lot of women. Mm -hmm. But there are things we can do about that. 
Absolutely. So, um, so as you mentioned, that midsection weight is where most women are noticing the weight coming on, and that's whether you're gaining weight or even if you're you haven't really gained much weight. It's almost a redistribution. Um, you get kind of thinner legs yes. and thinner arms and a little bit more over the abdomen. Right. So it's that visceral fat that's really problematic health-wise that we want and we need to really think about that and, and focus on making some changes. So you asked earlier, what, what do you need to change? Um, well, I would recommend focusing a lot more on our protein. We want to keep our muscle mass up. Um, as we age, we also start to uh, reduce um, muscle mass and, and that's what's going to keep our metabolism up as well. So um, there's a few ways we can maintain our muscle mass. One is strength training, which is also important. And the second is eating sufficient amounts of protein. And we may not have been thinking about that um, in the decades earlier, but it mm. becomes more and more important. It's also really satiating, so it helps to keep us fuller. Uh, we're satiated for longer, our energy is more even, lots of benefits for having enough protein. Do you tell your clients to track protein? There's definitely some benefits for tracking and we often will do that initially, partly to see where we're at. To become aware, because right. I often feel when I work with people, yeah. they say, oh, they're eating protein, they're good, they're yeah. good, they're eating protein. Mm -hmm. But then they may be having a bagel for breakfast with some mm -hmm. cream cheese, which doesn't have enough protein. Mm -hmm. Then they might maybe have a skip lunch or have a croissant and a coffee and they'll have their protein once a day at dinner mm -hmm. and unfortunately for women that is not good enough okay. as we lose that so you mentioned a couple of things that I want to get back on okay first was visceral fat you said we, do, we shouldn't be having visceral fat mm -hmm. and then the reason you said that I want to explain to our YouTube watchers and podcast listeners that what visceral fat means it means that's fat around the abdomen but the mm -hmm. same fat that sits around your abdomen goes and sit around in your liver and mm -hmm. around your heart and those are the things that increase your risk for type 2 diabetes and a heart attack. So that is just an outside marker of what's happening inside. Whereas mm -hmm. for people that have more weight on their hips and on their thighs, that is not as big risk factor for cardiovascular health, mm -hmm. but your risk of a heart attack is significantly bigger when you have more weight around the abdomen. So that's actually one of the measures we use when we look at someone's risk for a heart attack. We take their blood pressure, we look at their weight, but then we also look at their waist circumference. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult to give an exact number because of different ethnicities and different body sizes. You, you know, if you look, I am five foot six, my husband is six foot six. Obviously his stomach, you know, measurement, you know, would have different, a normal than my normal would be. Mm -hmm. But then we, those are tools that we use because there's science behind it that shows if you have that visceral fat, right. that right. increases your risk for a heart attack, mm -hmm. increases your risk for a stroke. Mm -hmm. And often people will come to me and perhaps they've found a little bit of fatty liver already starting. Yes. And we don't want to downplay those things because oftentimes um, perhaps their practitioner said, well, it's, it's just a small amount, don't worry. But that's really your body's sign that um, that some of these changes are happening and if you don't make a change yourself they're going to continue and that's if you've mm -hmm. been diagnosed with fatty liver that's really a sign showing us that your body is not coping with the amount of fats that mm -hmm. you have so that is quite critical to use that to kind of as a wake-up call to say now we need to make changes and that's a big thing that I want to really um, bring home to our listeners is you can change that if your mm -hmm. doctor told you you have fatty liver it doesn't mean that you're going to have fatty liver the rest of your life, mm -hmm. there are things you can do, and that is specifically what you teach clients. Exactly. What to do to mm -hmm. reverse your, to take your health back, to take your health into your own hands and make decisions specifically through nutrition, mm -hmm. through movement, to, to turn that around and get your liver healthy again. Exactly, so I've had clients come to me, they've had some testing done, their blood sugar is off, they've got a bit of fatty liver, and we do work together um, and they go back and have their next checkup and those things are now resolved or at least m much Amazing. much better and that's i mean this is that's very really rewarding I do. yes so that's rewarding. why you love your job yes right. exactly. good good yeah. good mm -hmm. so getting back to menopause and muscles so you were also talking about strength training mm -hmm. so that is quite something when we train and i see a lot of my patients fall into the spitfall please if you're perimenopausal don't fall in the spitfall what a lot of women do is as they start gaining weight they cut back on the amount of food they eat they reduce their calories and they start doing more exercise 
But what happens if you just cut back on your calories and you do more cardiovascular exercise, especially if you don't have enough protein, your body breaks down your own muscle for protein. And when you break down your own muscle, you have a bigger fat distribution, less muscle distribution, less muscle. What then happens is that your metabolism slows down even more. And there's been very good studies that's been done. There's an excellent book, The Obesity Code, written by a doctor here, Dr. Jason Fung, mm -hmm. who specifically talks about a lot of research that's been done. When people cut back and cut back on their calories, your metabolism just thinks you're in um, starvation mode, you're maybe in a war zone, and it just slows your metabolism, slows your metabolism. I'm sometimes surprised at mm -hmm. how little some of my patients eat. I'm the sa same, I feel the same surprise and um, it really does come from a history of yo-yo dieting as well where a lot of restriction has happened throughout the lifetime that makes it really challenging because the, the metabolism has, has really slowed has down. Slowed down. Mm -hmm. And if you think about that, if someone is maybe three times my size, they don't mm -hmm. eat three times as much as me every day. Mm -hmm. We might be eating the same amount of food we might be eating differently. I make sure that when I eat food that everything is full of nutrition, you know, all calories are not the same. Mm -hmm. I won't get the same nutrition from a bagel than I would from fresh veggies cut up with protein, you right. know, even mm -hmm. if it's the same amount of calories. And I, mm -hmm. I think that that's where you really come in to teach that nutrition, which foods to avoid, mm -hmm. which foods that you should eat. So the first thing you said is more protein. Right. Then you said strength training. Yes. To strengthen your muscles. Right. And exactly. That's a big one. That we, yes. can, we can do a whole podcast on that one. Strength exactly. training. Then the next one is sugar. Yes. Tell me about sugar and menopause. So we, as um, I mentioned earlier, we become more insulin resistant uh, as we get into menopause. Estrogen is one of those things that helps to manage that. And now we have less of it. So we need to manage it ourselves with diet. So that means less sugar, less flour type foods. And that's not to say that you can't eat healthy carbohydrates, but we want to shift where your carbohydrates are coming from. Like you said, more nutrient dense sources. So our veggies, um, fresh fruit, whole, whole grains or starches or you know, sweet potato and so on. That's gonna be much better in terms of a, of a carbohydrate than bread or pasta or crackers. Now that's a big thing. So you mentioned mm -hmm. insulin resistance. So what insulin resistance is, is our pancreas has this incredible ability to secrete insulin every time when you eat something sugary. And then that insulin's job is to um, build, those, build that sugar. So first you have sugar in your bloodstream to run with. Mm -hmm. So ideally you should be like a young kid running up and down all day. If you're not running up and down, that sugar gets stored into fat to use next time that you do run. But then if, as you get exposed to a lot of sugar throughout your life, your, your body becomes resistant and you kind of need, so, so it's kind of twofold. On the one hand, people get, they, you, their liver get tired of secreting insulin, but then on the other hand, often the, the, your body allows much higher levels of sugar because it got used to you always eating extra sugar, eating extra sugar, so your body doesn't secrete insulin as easily. So there, this is now kind of twofold. So you want your body to secrete insulin. If your body does not secrete enough insulin, that's when you're at risk of getting type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. If your blood sugar is a little bit high all the time, that causes inflammation. Inflammation really drives cancer and it drives autoimmune diseases. So insulin is your body's natural way of reducing your blood sugar and reducing that inflammation. So you want your body to be very sensitive to that and, and that is quite remarkable that mm -hmm. if you've been diagnosed by your doctor with metabolic syndrome with insulin resistance that it is that you can change it yes. it's really your choice if you continue doing what you've been doing you are going to end up maybe with medication diabetes pill and if you then still continue you'll need insulin at a point mm -hmm. if your body's really not making insulin anymore but then if you come to bonnie then mm -hmm. bonnie can help you and there are things that you can do in your diet to to reduce your sugar intake. And this is what you've been talking about. There's things like bread and bagels and muffins, mm -hmm. which our bodies doesn't need. There's no nutrition from it. There's really, really no nutrition from eating a bagel. But then if you, rather than having a bagel for breakfast, you can maybe have tomatoes and eggs, mm -hmm. then your sugar doesn't have that spike. What, what do you advise women that goes through menopause? What does a good breakfast look like? Well, this, this is a great conversation because 
Breakfast is one of those meals that's hard to get enough protein. Yes. Um, because of our typical breakfast, as you mentioned, bagels and so on. So some, and on the go. That's, that's yeah. right. And it needs to be quick, especially, right, um, during the week. So a few good options. Uh, a smoothie is a good option if that's something that you like. Um, I'll often recommend a protein powder in there. There's some other options like hemp seeds and different things that you can do to add protein to that. You can um, make it taste good with berries, um, get some healthy fats with uh, say avocado or a little nut butter. So I always recommend trying to have um, blood sugar balancing foods in every meal, which would be protein, healthy fats and fiber. So again, the veggies in your smoothie might be fiber. So a smoothie is a great option. Um, a chia pudding as an example again you can stir in a little bit of protein in that and leave that overnight add some berries on the top so what would you do yeah. for chia pudding you'll mm -hmm. take chia seeds and mix them with some liquid and then overnight and they put will protein powder in protein powder in and it will absorb all the water it will absorb it becomes kind of a pudding mm -hmm. and then you can add different things to make it taste delicious like uh, berries you can drizzle a little nut butter on the top of it um, on when you're serving it okay and that's a big mm -hmm. thing is quite often people tell me oh they can't eat fruit they don't want to eat fruit they don't want to gain weight mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. also not all fruit would be created equal. That's right. So things like you specifically mentioned berries, mm -hmm. because in berries it doesn't have as much sugar, but it has a lot of antioxidants, phytonutrients. Mm -hmm. You know, those are the things that really make your skin look good, make you feel good, make you strong. Exactly. <laughs> that nourish your muscles. Mm -hmm. And then something else I often see is people tell me that I want to add fruit, but they'll have at night, they'll have a glass of wine and they'll have chips. So from my mm -hmm. perspective, it is better to eat fruit, yep. but to try to avoid the chips and avoid whatever sugar you consume through drinking. So that's another thing is um, later in the evening yeah. when people like to snack. Um, if you want a, something sweet after dinner, then like you said, I recommend a piece of fresh fruit mm. um, because that'll give you the sweet that you're after, but it's got fiber in it as well. And it does have naturally occurring sugars, but one piece of fruit after a meal is, is going to be much better than the yeah. wine and chips. Yeah, <laughs> for sure, for sure. Yeah. But then also if your taste buds, and that was me, I was used to eating chocolate after dinner. So if I was yeah. just to eat fruit, I would say, oh, this is not good enough. I'll still grab chocolate after. Mm -hmm. But this is, this is the amazing thing. This is something that your body can learn over time. Mm -hmm. Any habit takes you about three weeks to lock in. Yeah. And that is why when we work with clients at Wellness MD, I sign up clients for six months. Because I've seen if I teach people things and they get this new habit, then it's easier after a month to kind of go back to old habits. And then we don't have these amazing results that we have if you just stick a little bit longer. So it's hard in the beginning. It is. But and it's so, three so, weeks. That's yeah. hard. And then it gets easy. Absolutely. And, and sometimes it can be in stages. So yeah. while you might feel like um, in the plan that you have that you need to make a number of changes, start with one thing and get really dedicated to that make that a part of who you are and a part of really your lifestyle and your routine and then you can add a new habit and if you add a new one every three weeks think of where you'll be in six months that's the amazing have you yeah. read that book um atomic habits by yes. jan Steer? that's mm -hmm. a great book mm -hmm. yes I've, i mentioned this yeah. book to each one of my clients that yeah. i work with yeah. to, because quite often we do a lot of work and we don't see the results especially with nutrition yeah. you might eat perfectly and you'll feel, oh, but I'm still having some menopausal symptoms. You know, why is it? But yes, it is helpful. It's nourishing mm -hmm. your, mu your muscles. It's making you stronger. It's improving mm -hmm. your sleep. Your, your food during the day, limiting your sugar fluctuations during the day, does improve your sleep at night. Let's chat about that, about how hot flushes. Are there some things people can do regarding hot flushes in their diet? Yes, I've found that with my clients, those who manage their blood sugar well and also manage their stress do have diminished um, hot flashes. So there, it is a vasomotor um, type of response, um, but it also, uh, it does relate to our cortisol as well. So managing stress um, can really be helpful in that regard. And even if it's not perfect, like you say, sometimes um, you're feeling like, I'm wondering why I'm doing all this because I'm not 100% perfect, but you don't realize how far you've come it's become a new normal that it's yes. much much better than it was and it's worth it to keep going and making those small changes mm -hmm. right you don't have mm -hmm. to radically eat like bunny you can right. just make small changes exactly. every day to yes. just improve every day little bits mm -hmm. yes and that's quite fascinating because hot flushes is something mm -hmm. that i see a lot of people for right there's different ways that we manage hot flushes 
hot flushes but to really understand that your diet and mm -hmm. eating a diet that so the one thing first that we advise is to not eat a diet that's processed Mm -hmm. And it was, I've always had a hard time wrapping my mind around processed because I used to think processed just means salami meats. Mm -hmm. But processed is really anything that gets made in a factory. So if you get something on a farm, like veggies, and you mm -hmm. chop it up yourself, these are good foods. Good foods that come in a package and it has 20 ingredients mm -hmm. on it, you know, with little stars and little yeah. numbers, though, that is processed. And those are essentially quite often toxins to our bodies because mm -hmm. our bodies can't really metabolize those and you know we'll talk about that a little bit more i think later mm -hmm. but that's inflammation which you can yeah. do a whole new podcast on inflammation so right. watch our next podcast on inflammation so but those foods really drive inflammation but yes. then it also drives inflammation during menopause mm -hmm. and if your body is inflamed you will the science shows us you will have more hot flushes more often most fascinating read in the economist no it was in the nature magazine so nature magazine is a very well respected magazine in the medical community it just published latest research science where they've done this amazing um, study where they find so our hypothalamus mm -hmm. is our body's temperature control area so what they found that is your estrogen really helps you to manage your temperature mm -hmm. and then when your estrogen decrease 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 that's when you'll get these hot flushes because it's now a rapid decrease mm -hmm. and then after you've gone through menopause your body is now used to not having estrogen help regulate so it creates different pathways and creates other ways to help you regulate your hormones and uh, your temperature but then during menopause, before you can make those new pathways, as your estrogen decreases, then your extra estrogen is enough again. Mm -hmm. And your body thinks, okay, it doesn't need different pathways. The estrogen is still on board to help us regulate our temperature. And then suddenly your estrogen drops again, and then you get a hot flush again. Right. So as your estrogen's going up and down. Up and it's down. not a, it's yes. not exactly a gradual decline yes. that we would like, yes. right? It's a little bit like reverse puberty where you're... It's yes. your hormones are all over the place. Yes. Yeah. And then once you've gone through that, mm -hmm. and sometime after when there's really little estrogen left, then your hypothalamus, which is now literally double in size, that they've done in studies. And that's incredible to know that your brain is rewiring itself mm -hmm. during menopause. You know, mm -hmm. So that's such a great opportunity where I find that people can really rethink who they are, reestablish themselves, reinvent themselves, because your brain enables you, because your brain is rewiring itself. Mm -hmm. You can heal from old relations, unhealthy relationships. Mm -hmm. You really add a, on a clean slate here when you go through menopause, where you can decide where do you want to be, how are you going to get there, What because you have the half of your life left. If right. you go through menopause at 50 and you're going to mm -hmm. live till 100, mm -hmm. what, what is the second half of your life going to look like? And I hope to all of our listeners and watchers, it will be a healthy second half. Yes. Really focus on nutrition because you are what you eat. Absolutely, so, that all of our cells, um, are operate on based on what we give them and what we give them is everything we ingest and absorb and that's primarily our foods yes mm -hmm. so what else do you recommend so we, we're now talking about breakfast where you really recommend smoothie or a chia or a, um, egg breakfast as you mentioned eggs are a great option as well they don't have as much protein as you might think eggs doesn't only about six grams per egg so oh, i've been pushing eggs like you have no idea well they're still a great option <laughs> but you might need to eat about three of them to get enough um, protein. protein or add some other other protein sources with your eggs and with chia seeds how much do you need that's where i I would suggest adding a bit of a protein right. powder okay. in with your chia as well because okay. it's not quite enough by itself. Okay, Hemp so. seeds are a good source of protein as well. Um, but say you're having some eggs, you can throw some edamame beans on mm. the side and that's a great source of protein. So maybe two eggs with some edamame. Um, some, sometimes you could make um, some homemade um, breads with either flax or with uh, an almond flour and that might mm. get you a little bit more protein as yes. well. Yes, I'm yeah. only talking about edamame, so yeah. that is something we talk quite a bit about in the menopause community, mm -hmm. is soy foods, because soy foods have phytoestrogens in them, which are things that it doesn't convert into your body in estrogen, so mm. if a man eats it, he's not going to now have estrogen or too much estrogen in their body. But it really fulfills quite the same function. So when we do go through menopause and our body does lack some estrogen, 
because healthy soy is like edamame yeah. really fulfills that function mm -hmm. it really helps to move off some of the symptoms that you might be experiencing edamame is a great sample yeah. of a healthy soy are there yeah. other soy products that you recommend to people um that's the main one that i focus okay. on if you have an organic tofu or tempeh that might be yes another tofu and tempeh are like great those. as well yes mm -hmm. because we've had all this care so a lot of soy products are really processed mm -hmm. and are um, genetically modified so because of that a lot of people really just wanted to run away from soy but we don't have to run away from soy we must just make sure that it's whole foods exactly okay so that's quite exciting. and um, flax seeds is another good phytoestrogen yes. so I have a recipe it's actually on my website where um, I will put links down below for okay. your website um, and you can you can make a flax seed bread so yes. I, I make it ahead of time slice it up keep it in the freezer and then you can pull out a slice when you want it yeah oh, that's great mm -hmm. yes nice so that's a good one yeah. so you don't have to just stop all bread right you must just make sure that it's very healthy very nutrient dense breads mm -hmm. are there any breads that you buy a store that you can recommend the type of bread i actually the one that i like the best is it's an almond flour bread it has very clean ingredients um it's the slice of life carb wise bread okay um whole foods organic garage goodness me are some stores that carry it Okay. And mm -hmm. have you been to that Danish pastry house? Yes. They Do you know they have that seed bread? They have bread? a good seed loaf. Yes. I love it. I buy yes. it all the time. So that's, that's a good one amazing. Too. It's a seed loaf and there's no mm -hmm. flour in it. Right. So it's just made mm -hmm. of seeds. Exactly. <laughs> yes, we've had that. It's also good. I love it. Yes, that's a very good one. Yeah. And then so you can still have bread. You just want to make sure that it's healthier choices that mm -hmm. you make. And then, so what would you then recommend for lunch? So, oh, that's mm -hmm. a big question. Do you recommend intermittent fasting for women as they go through menopause? Mm, you know, it doesn't work for everyone and you can customize it to yourself. So some form of, I'll call it time-restricted eating, uh, can be beneficial at least 12 hours overnight. I don't really consider that fasting. I consider that just a normal um, average Going but to some sleep. people, <laughs> yeah. But some people will definitely, especially mm -hmm. if you're a ten o'clock snacker and you have something ten o'clock every right. night, you will consider this a form of fasting, or as you said, mm -hmm. maybe time restricted eating. Exactly. So you say that that's good. I would to say at least give your 12 body hours. a twelve hour break. At least twelve hours would be considered normal. Um, whether or not you expand that to be thirteen hours or fourteen hours is really up to how that feels in your body. For some, if they're already in a heightened stress state, mm -hmm. that may put additional un unneeded stress, um, but others feel really great. So if you are delaying eating in the morning, but then you find you're overeating at night, then I would say that formula is not working mm -hmm. for you. Uh, so then I wouldn't do that. Um, okay. So we really have to experiment. And like you asked at the beginning about journaling, journal mm -hmm. uh, when your last bite is at night and when your first bite is in the morning and see where your starting point is. Mm. What are you doing naturally without thinking about it? And think about whether you want to expand that by an hour or so. Okay, mm -hmm. Okay. so you do think mm. there is benefit? In there definitely is some benefits, okay. but it's not for everyone. Okay. So see, yeah. and that's the yeah. thing, that's why I'm always so mm -hmm. careful, because there's a lot of research saying yeah. intermittent fasting is great, yeah. it's helps for cancer, it helps for fatty liver, it helps right. for um, increasing muscle mass, but then I work with patients who are really have adrenal fatigue and they're not sleeping well and life is just they're at such a burnout phase and then they've now to try to be healthier than intermittent fasting on top of that and mm -hmm. was just too much for their body it's too much at once right yeah so yeah. it always almost make me scared to say anything to everyone because everyone is so different and everyone is in a different phase That's right. so you might be doing incredible with intermittent fasting when you're on holidays and you're on a cruise and life is good but then once you, when you're back at work and things are really high set because that's what we find with women when they go through menopause women are quite often at the height of their career mm -hmm. that's you're in a very stressful stage because typically maybe you'll have aging parents you're looking after you'll have teenager kids so you might be at a very stressful stage in your home life and then in your career being at the height of your career also brings more responsibility so that also causes more stress so and now if you go through this hormonal fluctuations you're not sleeping well and now you're not eating it's too much for the majority of my patients as they go through menopause to now to try to do intermittent fasting on top of that right but exactly. that's very, so it's very customized yes. you want to make sure you're listening to your body and how it's responding to to what you're doing yes sure. yes for sure mm -hmm. 
And then, so what other foods do you advise that's great for menopause? Uh, well, as I mentioned, so enough protein, um, healthy fats, and yes. fiber. So, and with healthy fats, you mm -hmm. say avo, flaxseed, avocado, flaxseed, um, olive oil, um, coconut, olives, nuts, nut butters, and, and all of these foods. are whole foods. Exactly, it's not something from a factory, something that's really whole foods. That you yes. So, whole so the sources of fat are much better if they come from whole food sources. Um, definitely, they are satiating. Uh, many of them have, are good in omega-3s, uh, the fatty fish, for instance, things like that, that you can get your omega-3s from as well. Okay. Those are very anti-inflammatory, the omegas. Yes, yes, yeah. to add a little bit of fish. Mm -hmm. So with my kids, we love fish. We eat salmon twice a week. Oh, okay. But now what my kids started doing, I just got salmon from a new distributor. I was very happy because mm -hmm. it's like organic and um, wild caught salmon but it has this thick skin and like last night then my kids are like scratching their fish away from the skin they don't want this skin and i'm like yes, i don't blame where, them that's, that's where all your good oils are yeah, you can yeah. really but they're just like <laughs> dissecting through their food i was like oh yeah. goodness i'll have to go back to my old costco salad. right <laughs> they like that more so yes yeah, so that is very helpful is your fish and that's what we've um, done quite a lot of research about is they found that people do well with these um, healthy omega oils from fish mm -hmm. and then everyone, me, us included, my mom when I was through high school, everyone was buying fish oils mm -hmm. and we were taking fish oil supplements. But then they saw that the outcome was not necessarily better. So if you eat your regular diet that you always eat, which would be maybe the standard American diet, which has too much sugar, too much carbs, and you just add fish oils, those people didn't do better. So the studies that initially showed that people live longer, are healthier, have less heart attacks, less Alzheimer's disease, are people who had fish in their diet. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that must, you must really have those healthy fish in your diet rather than just popping the fish oil pills. Yep. That, well, and that's the point of supplements is they're meant to supplement an already healthy diet. Yes. They're not meant to replace it. Chat about supplements. Why do you tell mm. your clients about supplements? Well, we really want to be intentionally selecting supplements. So we don't want to just take them because your friend took it or, or something like that because your issue may be relate, related to something else. But having said that, you also do want to listen to your body and see where there are some signs of deficiency or perhaps use some testing um, to see where you're deficient. Um, and do your best to get as much as you can from the diet, but it's also understandable that much more challenging nowadays. Um, and also our need for uh, nutrients is greater. Our stress levels are a little higher. Uh, environmental toxins that our body is dealing with um, are greater. So our demand for nutrients is greater while our foods contain less of it. So sometimes supplementation is needed. Yes, and I want to pause on what you said. Mm -hmm. So you say our food contain less. The reason is mm -hmm. that our soil really got depleted mm -hmm. from magnesium, potassium. I'm so surprised when I, it's so easy for me in a hospital when I admit a patient, I can just test for everything. So I would test for everything, zinc, copper, potassium, yeah. magnesium, calcium. Yeah. And I'm so surprised that all my patients come in deficient and this would I work in an area where people have enough food on the table we're not in a um, malnourished population mm -hmm. and still my patients are all malnourished you, you know so that is right quite scary you can be overfed but undernourished yes yes, right? yes. That's, that's this little and, saying <laughs> and that's the other thing as well mm -hmm. right we are often have patients that look like they're lean and they look like in a good shape but they're also malnourished right? right from intentionally mm -hmm. that's a whole new podcast on its own people who you know especially through menopause if you want to look good still yeah. be the same size people do malnourish themselves and that's what we want to encourage to eat in such a way that you're not becoming malnourished so not to cut calories but to right. cut unhealthy foods and to focus on healthy calories okay so our foods not necessarily contain all the nutrients even if you eat a very um, healthy organic diet it might be that your food doesn't have all the nutrients in next thing is you might have a leaky gut yes and then even if you have a perfect diet your food has all the nutrients your body might not be absorbing can you talk about that a bit absolutely so issues with gut health can really impair our metabolism because those nutrients are needed as cofactors for running our metabolism so if we're nutrient deficient um, whether it's from our diet or from our uh, imbalanced imbalances in our gut so that we're not absorbing those nutrients, that can be a big factor in, uh, in menopause and how our metabolism is running as well. 
and you can mm -hmm. often get cravings as well because of some deficiencies well absolutely mm -hmm. there can be imbalances in the gut microbiome perhaps um, or a fungal overgrowth that that may be triggering uh, the cravings and you might think oh, I don't have enough willpower but really it may be actually a physiological a message that you're getting to crave those foods because of your gut imbalance mm. and mm. I find I really find it's never when I work with clients one-on-one -on -one, it's never willpower they think they come in and they think oh they don't have enough willpower but mm -hmm. it, when you journey with them through it you really realize though it's a problem with leptin and cortisol you know it's really been mm. and maybe other inflammatory foods or inflammatory behaviors that drives this process right. it's not about self-control mm -hmm. you talk about testing as well what type of testing do you do so I do um, gut testing, so it's stool testing, so we can look at the microbiome, we can see uh, the balance between the good bacteria, overgrowth bacteria, fungal overgrowth, any pathogens, in, as well as functions of your digestive enzymes, um, bowel flow, gut inflammation, uh, sensitive, sensitivity to uh, gluten. These are That's some of the things. That's a big one, eh? Mm -hmm. Do you ever put people on an elimination diet? So or do you prefer testing? I, I prefer some form of testing, um, but not always actually. It's, there's some of the big ones are gluten, um, dairy is another one that, that some, but oftentimes people are coming to me and they already kind of know. It's a bit mm. like an elimination diet. They kind of know what they're reacting mm. to. They say, oh, every time I have cheese, I get bloating. So we test out, you know, let's pull some of these foods out and see how you feel after a few weeks. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes an elimination diet can be helpful, but testing is, is a great way to identify um, what, you know, what your body's actually reacting to. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. And then also that awareness, you say a lot of people coming to you already know it, whereas yeah. I often feel that people don't know it. I, <laughs> I was at a big meeting, a um, business meeting yesterday morning, and a lovely lady sitting next to me, I could clearly see she has these puffy eyes and right. around her eyes and it's such a clear sign of inflammation mm -hmm. and I was like debating with myself the whole time do you tell a random stranger at a business <laughs> networking meeting you know what your face is puffy because of inflammation you can change this three weeks of a different diet all the yeah. puffiness will be gone right <laughs> but, then, but you're, you know what you are right but I do think when you dive into it and you work with someone and you tease out everything it kind of comes to light that they re they realize yes. um, what's causing it when you start to educate them and and then they think about what they're eating and how they feel after certain foods. Um, mm -hmm. So definitely, it's it's a two way street when you yeah. work with someone um, because we don't know what's going on in their in their house, and so they share how they feel, what they're eating, and then we provide the education, and then together we come up with. Um, you know what the real the root causes are and the yes. best strategy for yes. them yeah. and that's what i've really found my clients mm -hmm. where i've seen most success are people who are diligently logging their mm -hmm. foods their symptoms their mood because it's a lot of work to log yeah. so i understand why everyone doesn't want to do that yeah. but <laughs> it really helps your your nutritionist your health coach to go through that and to to help you draw the lines between the dots mm -hmm. to kind of make those conclusions because it's quite often hard on ourselves because we are very subjective when it comes to our own symptoms you know if you have this idea in your head that you're sensitive to this mm -hmm. you know it might be or you might think you're doing very well with it because you don't realize your brain fog or your mm -hmm. achy joints or just that little bit of a dull headache you don't realize that it's really been triggered by food by inflammation mm -hmm. so then it really helps to have that second set of eyes mm -hmm. yep. yes that's someone to bounce something off of and make you realize um, what's really happening and what's going on and what the root causes yes for you. yes so mm -hmm. before we wrap up anything else that you can tell women when they go through menopause nutrition wise well, definitely, uh, we've covered the protein, healthy fats, fiber is really important as well. We want to optimize our gut health, fiber will feed our gut, good uh, gut microbiome, um, keep us regular, again, that, which is really important. A lot of people don't realize that they're, that they're not. Um, and that's important, <laughs> to be regular. Mm -hmm. If you constipated and you don't have a bowel movement every day, you're at a higher risk of getting colon cancer. Mm -hmm. Even if it's not colon cancer, then you're at a higher risk of your body keeping all your, your environment has quite a lot of toxins in it mm -hmm. and the longer those toxins are in your gut being absorbed it's not good for you so the best way is to really just get rid of that i mean it's been earmarked for removal so you want to make sure it has a clear exactly. way out and also if um, 
um, your your body's hormones are also metabolized through your through your gut. So we want to keep keep it moving properly because for hormone balance as well. So that's a big thing, you know, mm-hmm. and I didn't really realize it as much until I started studying lifestyle medicine and functional medicine and integrative medicine that 90% of your happy hormone, your feel good hormone is really made in your gut. Mm -hmm. So when we give someone an antidepressant, that would be a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. We take that serotonin that's already in your brain being secreted, broken down, and we just help it to be slow the breaking down process so that the serotonin molecules are there for a little bit longer before they get absorbed again. But you can actually increase the amount of serotonin being secreted in your gut by having a very, very healthy diet. They've done studies mm-hmm. where they looked at people who are depressed and not depressed and looked at their stool samples and mm-hmm. saw that mm-hmm. certain bacteria are more prevalent in um, people who are more depressed. And then people, if you really want to increase your happy hormones, you the way you do that is by eating whole foods to make sure that you eat veggies three times a day, that you eat healthy proteins, that you drink loads of water and there are things that can supercharge you. Those would be fermented foods like sauerkraut yes. and kimchi yep. that can really ferment um, the help of your gut. And kefir is a good one. If you don't like dairy, you can have a kefir that's made with uh, okay. non-dairy. Yeah, yes. or something or cashew kefir, yes, yeah, yes, different yes. one. And so that's, that's like a probiotic pill on mm-hmm. steroids. Right. And there's recipes that you can make your yeah. own kefir. Too. And that's quite easy. You can just Google it, and where you just make your take your own almond. You can make your own almond milk. I've even done that. And I've done that. Yeah. Yes, uh-huh. yes. So you can well, you can take almonds. You know that are good, healthy, organic, clean almonds, and you can make your own almond milk. And then with that almond milk, you can take probiotic capsules, empty yeah. it up, and make your own yogurt. You know, you can actually mm-hmm. when you have time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I must admit, all of these mm-hmm. things, I love the idea of doing it. So mm-hmm. I would do it. But then just from a practicality point, I don't have time to do it every day. Not all the time, but sometimes. I actually did make cashew milk this morning. Oh, good for you. So, but I do buy it as well. So yes. you're right. You have to do when you can do it. It's great. Um, but don't be hard on yourself if you can't do it all the time. My trick, what I do is when I buy products, is I have an app on my phone. And you can look in your area, because I know we have um, podcast listeners and show watchers from all over the world. Thank you, because I get comments from all over. So don't purchase this app if it's not in your country, but I use the Yuka app. It's called Y-U-K-A. Yes, I've heard of that one. Which is a Mm -hmm. local app. Mm -hmm. There's the Think Dirty app as well. Yes, I have that too. And then you can have a free app in wherever Mm -hmm. you live. Well, you can, when you go through the store, you can just scan your products and it will show you if the additives that's in your milk or in your product if it is safe or unsafe Mm -hmm. and it has suggestions for you so if you scan a product and it shows no this additive has been shown to um, cause cancer and it's actually banned in three different countries it's just not banned here for some reason (laughs) (laughs) then um, it shows alternatives it says oh but you can use this product or that product that's those are green products that are safe to use so I really recommend and then if you don't have an app there is a website that you can have a look at the environmentalworkinggroup.org it's a good one. Yes, mm-hmm. and then you can check all your products on there and it really shows which products are safe and which products we should rather avoid. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Talking about that, the other thing we didn't cover was your brain health. There's quite mm-hmm. a lot of things. So during menopause, women often um, come to me and they say they have brain fog. They feel depressed, mm-hmm. they feel more anxious, they feel irritable, they feel different. They feel that they're not themselves. They didn't feel calm. They didn't feel that they can be present and intentional with their family. Good news. You can turn that around with your diet, with other things as well. And in my book, I cover everything. In my book, Thrive Through Menopause, that book's going to be a game changer for you. I cover everything in that book on nutrition, on movement, on everything you need to do and specifically under brain fog. But can you tell Mm -hmm. us what can you do from a diet perspective to improve your your brain health? So one of the things that you can do is um, increase your consumption of a nutrient called choline. It's it's regulated with estrogen. So as we have, we can make it ourselves and we can consume it in foods. But we're going to be making less in, in menopause because it's regulated by estrogen. So some of the great sources of choline are going to be egg yolks, um, meat, fish, poultry. So again, coming back to our proteins um, are really important for, so we want to eat more of that because it's really good for brain health, liver health, really every cell in the body, but in particular for our brain fog. 
and then so you're talking egg meats and fish mm -hmm. so if your client is a vegan why do you advise there well it's going to be a little challenging there might be a supplement that you can take for for choline and mm. specifically um because in particular choline is in the animal foods mm. Mm -hmm. and then what you can also try to do is to try to get safer sources of your food mm -hmm. so that's what i quite often find that's it is expensive mm -hmm. and I feel that's the biggest barrier for a lot of people is really the expense to try to find those organic sources of meat but if you can if you really search very hard quite often we can find a local cooperative where there is local farmers that sell directly to consumers where you can kind of buy step the marketing mm -hmm. and a, a lot of in-between middlemen where you can get it for not as expensive if you buy um, farm raised um, grass fed farm raised products directly mm -hmm. from a farm so that mm -hmm. that might be an option if you really look out for that lo in your local area absolutely so often those they'll they'll sell it um, say individually packaged and frozen so that you can buy lar larger quantities and save um, yes. because you're buying in bulk yes yes, yes. Mm -hmm. and then also to if you're very conscious of that aware of the nutrients that you're actually getting you can also make sure that you use it better you can use the the bones and make a bone broth from it yes and sure. especially through menopause i have a recipe for a good bone broth recipe in my in my menopause book because when you do go through menopause your collagen decreases mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that is what causes our skin just in general to become thinner so for that it's very helpful to use a good collagen and the best way really is to get it from animal products mm -hmm. So that might be a good option as well. Yeah, so if you're actually making it from bones, let's say you've had a turkey and you're gonna make, or, or some kind of meat, and you have the bones left over, if you, I leave it in the slow cooker, you can do it in a pressure cooker or a slow cooker, because then you can leave it on for say 24 hours, uh, in the case of a slow cooker. And if once you're finished, when you jar, put it in jars, put it in the fridge, if you see the gelatin in there, if it really gels up, you know that you've really, pulled a lot of the nutrients up and the collagen from the bones. And it's that gelatin that really helps mm -hmm. your joints. Because mm -hmm. yeah. that is quite something fascinating as we get older, and that is even aging on its own as a whole podcast on its yes. own, but as we get older and we don't get, because if you look 100 years ago, when people ate animals, they ate everything. They would eat um, the, They would eat everything. And we're now kind we of don't. avoiding everything yeah. else. We're just eating the muscle. That's right. So there's a lot of nutrients from the joints that we don't get. Mm -hmm. So we are now in that maybe first or second generation of people mm -hmm. not getting in those nutrients yeah. because it all gets discarded. So bone broth is a way to mm -hmm. get it in. And if the bones are very brittle when you're finished making it, that's another sign because now they're the brittle because you pulled all the, all the minerals from it. And mm -hmm. hopefully your bones will be less brittle exactly. after you. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that, and then so what I often sometimes advise people so when I have clients who want to do intermittent fasting what I sometimes advise them is to take bone broth first thing in the morning because mm -hmm. you can get bone broth that depending on how you made it mm -hmm. but generally bone broth has no carbs in it and you can buy a protein a powder that is we have one here that's very really good by Dr. Josh Axe um, Ancient Nutrition but you can look for a local mm -hmm. one, just a clean product, where you can blend it and have it first thing in the morning with warm water and it doesn't have any carbs, so mm -hmm. your body doesn't go outside of that intermittent fasting phase. It That's really right. helps for leaky gut, it yeah. soothes your gut. Yeah. So that might be an option for people who are really adamant they want to do their intermittent fasting. Yep, yeah, absolutely. It gets you a few calories and some energy, but without compromising the uh, the carbohydrates yes yeah. mm -hmm. yes yes mm -hmm. thank you so much for your time bonnie this was great speaking with you i'm going to, be to put all bonnie's links below bonnie is really an incredible nutritionist she can take your health your nutrition to totally to the next level we'll have her links below you can follow her on social as well we'll have her links below for that thank you bonnie thanks for having me take care Thank you for listening to this episode today by medical doctor Daniela Stein. Follow us on social media and subscribe to our newsletter at www.wellnessmdhealth.com to stay up to date on educational resources that will take your quality of life to the next level. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your healthcare provider. Never disregard medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard on this podcast. Remember, you are created to thrive.